Today's episode explores Civilian Self-Protection Program, or Auto Defense Civil, as it was referred to, which was an operation aimed at selecting reliable and capable Hutu youth for military training. Once this training was complete, they would be supplied with weapons to return to their communities and train other youth in these anti-enemy killings. The enemy of Rwanda had previously been defined in September 1992 by Colonel Deo Gracias Nsabimana, the former commander-in-chief of the Rwandan Armed Forces, as a Tutsi inside the country or abroad who never accepted the 1959 revolution and anyone who is considered a Tutsi ally or accomplice. <laughs> May 1994, first implementation of the plot to exterminate Tutsis through the strengthening of Autodefense Civil Program. Autodefense Civil Program was launched in 1991 by President Habyarimana. The coinciding so-called Autodefense Civil Operation and Genocide was widely used to kill Tutsis across the country, but its experiment had started in former Byumba and Rohingya prefectures. The Autodefense Civil was an operation aimed at selecting reliable and capable Hutu youth for military training and returning back in their communes after completing courses and being supplied with weapons to train other youth to use them in the so-called anti-enemy killings. The Autodefense Civil was launched in 1991 following the advice given by Lieutenant Colonel Gilbert Conovas, who was the advisor to the Commander-in-Chief of the Government Forces. In his report of April 30, 1991, he suggested that there was a need to arm and train ordinary citizens from Umutara area, especially in the former Mvumba and Rutari communes. The meeting was followed by another one on July 9, 1991, chaired by the Minister of Internal Security, General Augustin Dindiimana, which took place at the Army headquarters. It brought together intelligence officials from Army and the Presidency. The minutes of the meeting indicated that it was meant to assess the speedy implementation of the president's proposal on national security where he said that citizens should be provided with adequate equipment to fight for national sovereignty so that no one will dare attack the country again in the future. This implies that President Abdelimana himself ordered the selection of Hutu citizens to be given firearms. The military and political agencies only worked on accelerated implementation of the proposal. The meeting of the high officials of the army had decided that in order to implement the request of President Habyarimana, it was necessary to first carefully analyze the identity of the enemy, identify them, and then determine the proper way to deal with them. The task was given to Commander-in-Chief, and the army prepared a document aimed at establishing the enemy of Rwanda and how to fight them. The document was prepared and secretly published on September 21, 1992, signed by Colonel Deo Gracias Nsabimana, the former commander-in-chief of the Rwandan Armed Forces. He shared it with President Habyarimana to military and gendarme leaders across the country so that it can be taught to soldiers and gendarme. The document is one of the highlights of the genocide against the Tutsi preparation by the government which disseminated the genocide ideology materials. The main point in the documents were as follows. The enemy is no longer in Uganda only, but inside the country. This meant that a divisionist system had been launched to separate people and incite them to quarrel among themselves so that the bad Tutsis and good people Hutus appear and hence the good people would kill the bad under the pretext of getting rid of the enemy. Furthermore, the document said that the number of enemies inside the country had increased, which meant that, in the good part, Hutus must wake up and realize that there are many bad people, the Tutsis, and that requires more effort from each person of the good to get rid of the bad citizens. The document then continued to clearly define who was the enemy and where to look for them. It showed that the enemy consists of two parts. First, the main enemy is a Tutsi inside the country, or abroad, who has never accepted the 1959 revolution. This one must be found among Tutsi refugees, Ugandan troops, Tutsis inside the country, foreign men who marry Tutsi women, Hutus who are not satisfied with the current regime, foreigners of the same origin as Tutsis, criminals who fled the country. Second, 
The enemy's ally or accomplice, that's to say, anyone who gives the established enemy any help. This document is very important in the history of the genocide against the Tutsis because it determined how a Tutsi would be called an enemy of the country and determined that anyone who would support a Tutsi in any way would be treated as an enemy and killed. Another document indicating the nature of the auto défense civile was dated September 29, 1991, also written by Colonel Deo Gracia Sinsabimana, who was the Chief of Defense Staff in Mutara. It was addressed to the Minister of Defense and outlined the recommendations of the meetings that was held to establish the procedure for the implementation of the auto défense civile. And Sabimana said the meeting had decided that during the selection of those who would be trained and given weapons, the following should be ensured. At least one of the ten houses, Nyumbakumi, selected by the Burgumest, in collaboration with the Commune Council, should be taken. Colonel Sabimana also indicated the number of weapons to be provided as follows. Muvumba Commune was to be given 350. Muhura Commune, 580 weapons. Ngarama Commune was to get 530 weapons, and Ugisije commune was to be given 300 weapons. A total of 1,760 weapons were issued in 1991. In late January 1993 and early February 1993, Colonel Vagosola led an operation of firearms distribution to the Inerahamge militia of the northern region of the country. In his 1993 agenda, which was presented as evidence against him in his case at the ICTR, some pages containing information on distribution of 500 weapons in Mutura, Jichie, Ruvavu, and Rugwerere communes of Jisenyi Prefecture were exposed. January 1994 was marked by the joy of some Rwandans who were celebrating that 600 Ingotani soldiers and their politicians had arrived in Kigali on December 28, 1993, where they were ready to join the transitional structures as planned by the Arusha Peace Agreement. However, the Rwandan government and its forces were unhappy and started genocide mobilization activities, including intensification of Inerami militia training and arming them through the so-called autodefense civil. All of this was aimed at mobilizing Hutus to understand that all Tutsis are enemies of the country and should be killed. One of the key achievements was the appointment of leaders of the auto defense civil program throughout the country, especially responsible for the administration of arms distribution and training of killers. At the national level, the auto defense civil operation was assigned to Colonel Atanas Gasache, assisted with other leaders in the prefectures. In the city of Kigali, the commanding officer of the auto-defense civil was Commander Bivan Vagara in collaboration with the prefect of the city, Colonel Tarsis Renzaho. In Chiwungo, the commanding officer was Colonel Pierre Celestin Guagafilita. In Chigaringari, the operation was led by Major Stanislas Chinyoni. In Changugu, auto-defense civil was under the command of Colonel Sinjiranghavo. In Jitarama, it was led by Major Jean de Messen Ukurichie Yezu. In Butare and Yukongoro, it was under the command of a Colonel Alois Simba, who had deputies including Colonel Alphonse Nezirjayo, who was appointed Prefect of Wutare during the genocide. In Giseni and Ruhengeri, Auto Defense Civil was commanded by the commanders of the military in those prefectures, namely Colonel Anatol Senjumva in Giseni and Augustin Vizimungu in Ruhengeri, who was later replaced by Colonel Marcel Bivugabagabo. These high-ranking military officers were at the forefront of collaborating with authorities of the prefecture and commune to establish a mechanism for committing and accelerating the genocide. A confidential report dated 7th February 1992, written by a former representative of the Byumba Investigation Services called Guida Hira Vensa from Chibidira Commune in Giseni, outlined the progress of the implementation of the auto defense civil. Rugira Hira stated that the Ministry of Defense had agreed to supply 300 weapons to be delivered to selected population in Byumba and Rungeri prefectures. 180 were to be given to the people of Byumba and another 220 to be given to the people of Rungeri. According to Rugira Hira's report, a meeting was held at Ngaramasu Prefectural Headquarters to assess the progress of the auto defense civil and to approve the selection of 250 young men. The selection process was done in secret by the Burgumestre in collaboration with the Security Council of the Commune. 
The selected youth were sent to Gabiro military base, where they were to be trained in the use of firearms from January 29, 1992. Guida Hira added that the meeting decided to gradually increase the number of young people to be trained and that the Burgumestre would monitor the activity on a daily basis. At the Gabiro camp, the Inaramui militia training was led by Captain Engineer Nirichina Foster and Major Gwawukwisi Vanso. The two senior officers were very instrumental in implementing the genocide. Nidichina currently lives in France and was one of the key witnesses of Juge Bruguière in his false accusation against Rwanda. During the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi, soldiers led by Major Nidichina of the Huye Battalion camped at Mokigali and were among the perpetrators of Tutsi massacres in Nyamirambo, Birjogo, Nyakabanda and the surrounding areas. Some of the members of Inerangwe militia trained in Gabiro were from Mvumba commune, including Ngumvaneza Emmanuel, Nguruziza Elias, who was a counselor of Karama sector, Munyaninde Silvestre, who was the agricultural monitor, Kavurame Jean de Messen, and others. These members of Inerangwe militia were trained in 1992. One of the soldiers who trained them, Ndindabaizi Emmanuel, who spoke to the Rwandan Commission investigating France's role in the genocide, Mutia Commission, say that members of Inerangwe militia were being trained to shoot, but especially they were taught how to kill people in a short time using traditional tools. One of Gaviro's leading Inerangwe, Setiba Joseph, who led Inerangwe in Shironji commune, told the Mucho Commission that the number of Inerangwe trained in Gaviro in 1992 was between 600 to 700. As part of the plan, to carry out the genocide during the auto defense civile, Hutu youth were selected for military training and were given guns, ammunition, and grenades. The government also set up mechanisms to buy machetes and distribute them to the public in a short period of time. Those machetes were used by the killers during the genocide against the Tutsi. In February 1994, an employee of the British company Chillington confirmed their company had already sold many machetes to Rwanda in a few months more than those which had been imported through the entire year of 1993. Documents for the import licenses reviewed by Human Rights Watch between January 1993 and March 1994 show that 581 tons of machetes were imported into Rwanda. The imported machetes costed 95 million Rwandan francs, sponsored by Felicien Kabuga. According to the British newspaper, the Sunday Times of November 24th, 1996. Between August and December 1993, Chillington sold other machetes to two employees of Rwandan company called Rwandex, Barushimana Ejen and Vurasa Francois. Barushimana, who was an employee of Rwandex, was the son-in-law of Kabuga and the secretary general of the Inerangwe militia on the national level. Burasa was a retired soldier and a member of the Hutu extremist party CDR. He's also a brother to Jean Bosco Barayaguiza, one of the extremist party's top leaders. The acquisitions and distribution of machetes among civilians who had been given military training was part of the auto defense civil program identified in Vagosora's agenda. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of Quivoka Podcast. As always, make sure you leave us a review, sharing what you like about the podcast, and share with others who would be interested in listening. In listening.